So friends, welcome to Justice Matters. I am thrilled to have Victor G. Uh, he is a little bit younger than me. You can probably tell he's a member of Generation Z and I am one of the old heads. I'm one of the baby boomers. So I'm really excited to talk with him today about not only how he got involved in politics at a very young age, um, I wanna talk with him about how he inspires and encourages his generation to get involved. And then frankly, even more importantly, from my perspective, how my generation, how the older folks can go about encouraging and inspiring the younger generation to get involved, to take up the mantle and try to work on the things that my generation has been unable to fix or to solve or to improve. So with that, Victor, thank you for being with us today on Justice Matters. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on. And I and I just say you don't look too old, so uh, don't don't say you're that old. I, I appreciate it. Um, okay, so I I want to start with now. This is not a polite question, you know, in my generation, but I'm going to ask you to start with how old are you? And you're a college student now, right? Correct. Yeah. So I'm 20 years old, and I'm currently a junior at UCLA. What are you studying? Uh, American literature and culture. I actually started off as political science and, and was um, I was of the mindset that if you majored in poli sci, you would be able to go into politics. But I soon realized that political science was too much theory. So I switched to kind of a mix between English and history. And a, at age 20, I don't know that you should know precisely what you want to do with your life as a, you know, a, as a career. But what do you think you're going to gravitate toward? What do you have an interest in, you know, after you graduate and, and moving into the professional world? So I, I definitely want to stay involved in campaigns and politics. I think um, campaigns have given me such a thrill. And I think um, especially just kind of more specifically, communication and press um, are kind of things that I found to be really enjoyable, just fast paced, no one day is the same. And then um, I also co-host a podcast with Jill Weinbanks, and she's kind of pushed me toward the law school direction if um, one day I, I think of that. But it's always fascinated me. And, and watching your videos and seeing you on TV talk about the legal issues is just day down the road, um, law school. Um, okay, so one of the things as I was reading your, your bio um, that caught my attention is that at age 17 in 2020, you were the youngest elected delegate for Joe Biden. And I want to ask you how in the world at age 17, you became one of Joe Biden's elected delegates, but I actually want to back it up to when you were in eighth grade, because that's when I saw from your bio you first got involved in politics or in political activity. So my two questions for you are, why at age 12, 13, 14, I think I was about 13 when I was in eighth grade, why did you become interested in politics? And then how was it that you started to involve yourself? Yeah, so I, I think this might touch on a point that we want to get into later, which is um older people working with younger people and inspiring younger people to get involved in politics, because that was part of my path for getting involved. So in eighth grade, I was in my social studies classroom, and it was 2016, right before the Iowa caucuses. And so my teacher lectured the political spectrum. And at the time, I really didn't know what I was interested in. So I found that process completely fascinating, how you had someone like Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton on one end of the spectrum. And then you had Donald Trump on the other end, and they both represented such different values and ideologies. And I was just so just interested and, and fascinated by that process. And so um, she explained that process. And then by the end of the um, lecture classroom, she said that as young people, we have the power to make a difference. And she really empowered younger people just to take a step forward um, in our local communities and, and get involved some way, whether it's, um, you know, volunteering on a campaign or just, um, you know, voting. And, and I think part of that was really inspiring for, for me. And so I kind of got involved in politics from there started off on a local congressional campaign um, in 2016 on um, Brad Schneider's campaign, who's still a representative. I think he's um, wonderful. And from there, just kind of continued that civic engagement throughout high school. And then come senior year, I was um, 17 years old. And um, again, one of my teachers um, told me that there was a possibility of anyone who turns 18 by election day on uh, November 3rd, 2020, they could run to become a delegate for any presidential candidate. So it was kind of hearing my words, uh, the, the words of my teacher in eighth grade, that initially um, inspired me to get involved in politics. And then again, in 20, 
20, uh, my AP government teacher um, inspired me to run for office and just kind of nudging me toward that direction. And so um, I think there is a real power of, of teachers, but also adults kind of showing young people of all the possibilities involved in politics. Well, that warms this old teacher's heart. Um, my pop was a teacher and a high school football coach. So actually, and we didn't really do politics in my household when I was growing up. We did football and wrestling. And so that's what I gravitated toward. Um, but, you know, when you talk about the importance of teachers in sparking an interest in their students, you know, somebody recently asked me, what leaves you optimistic every day? And it wasn't a question I'd thought about, but in knee jerk fashion, I said, my students. It's my criminal justice students at George Washington University. They leave me optimistic because you can you can see it in the questions they ask. You can see it in their eyes that they really do want to try to make better uh, some of the, the weaknesses in government, in the criminal justice system. So I'm glad to hear it from the students' perspective that, you know, that really is what helped spark an interest in you to get involved in politics. Now, Tell the, the viewers, how is it that at age 17, what are the nuts and bolts of you getting involved as a delegate for Joe Biden? So it's a very esoteric process, actually, very, very complicated, and I think has a lot of different rules. But basically, in a nutshell, um, anyone can run to become a delegate. So you go to, I think each state does it differently, but at least in Illinois, where I ran to become a delegate, you started off by going to just this massive meeting for anyone who's interested in becoming a delegate. Every single presidential campaign is there. And you basically throw your name in the ring and um, you, you connect with the campaign that you're interested in. So at the time, I was interested in uh, then candidate Joe Biden's campaign. And so I... Um, um, met with someone from that campaign, a representative, and then she gave me this form to fill out. So there's this application to become a delegate. And then um, every campaign based off that application selects about five people or prospective delegates um, from each congressional district. So in my congressional district, there was five candidates who ended up um, getting selected, and I was fortunate to be one of them. And then from there, um, you have to gather petition signatures, just like any other office. Um, at the time, I think it was you had to gather 200 petition signatures. It was in the winter time, very cold weather. And so you had to go to um, you know the Whole Foods, you had to go to the grocery store, just anywhere where um, voters are concentrated. And so that really taught me, um, I did a lot of campaigning for other candidates, before, but to do campaigning for myself was a completely different experience. And so that was um, up and through kind of winter. And so then you get your signatures and you get it certified by the uh, Board of Elections, get it notarized. And then after that, you basically, uh, once you get your name uh, certified, then you start campaigning to uh, run for office, knowing that your name is going to be on the ballot in um, the primary process. And so um, I really had no expectation going into it. I was up against four people. I think all of them were serving in the Illinois State Legislature. And so I was just this 17 year old run to become delegate and um, just kind of threw my name in the in the ring and then uh, come March uh, after primary day they basically do a proportional way of, of allocating um, delegates so Joe Biden happened to win 60% of the vote in um, my congressional district and so they sent three out of the five um, delegates and I happened to barely squeak out to get the third most votes and so um, that's kind of the process of, of being <laughs> uh, running to become a delegate and then also um, getting elected to become a delegate. Wow. So did you have to print up, you know, uh, yard signs, Victor G for delegate and go out? No, it's a, let me let me ask you this. Did that experience um, make you think maybe I want to run for office someday? Did it maybe dissuade you from wanting to run for office someday? Did it have no impact? I would say, I mean, it really inspired me in terms of kind of seeing what it's like to run for office. And you mentioned the yard signs. I didn't have yard signs, but I had these little cards that I would give out to my friends and they would distribute word of mouth and, and use social media. But um, in terms of kind of what it did to, to influence my decision to run for office, I probably wouldn't run for office again, especially in this political environment. I think there are many people who can, uh, who that's suited for. Um, I think just this vitriol is, is getting to a really high level. And um, I've enjoyed more kind of working behind the scenes and helping candidates and and and, and organizing. And so who knows what will happen in, in 20 years, but at least for now, I think that process um, was interesting, but definitely, I think, um, can't imagine myself running for office in, in the near future. Okay, so now you're a member of Generation Z, correct? Yeah. And then between you and I, there are a couple other generations kicking around. There's the millennials, there's the Gen Xers. So let me start by asking you from your perspective, 
what do you find to be some of the most effective ways or messages to get your generation engaged in civics, in government, in you know the affairs of your town or your city? So I would have two two ways of answering that question. First is I think just by looking at the composition of Generation Z, I think it tells us a lot. First of all, we're the most diverse generation in America. We're also the most digitally connected generation in America. So if you look at how many of Gen Generation Z members have at least one social media platform, it's more than 97% of us. And so when you talk about how do you reach Generation Z, it's different from other generations because a lot of us are concentrated online spaces. So you look at Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, Snapchat, um, Twitter, um, these different social media platforms, that's how you get information across to Generation Z because that's where Generation Z consumes most of their information. And so um, on campaigns and in politics, you know, whereas maybe you you go knock on a door to, to uh, meet a, and reach an older generation, for Generation Z, you really have to go to those social media platforms and reach them that way. And so I think there's this there's that element of reaching Generation Z, which is just you have to be on social media and you have to craft this um, narrative that is kind of digestible and speaks to Generation Z in a very personal way because our attention spans are short. Um, actually, I think the last time I read, less than four seconds. And so um, the, the ability to reach us is, is hard. And so you have to um, make sure that you find those engaging and, and compelling uh, snippets. So, so I think that's one way that you reach Generation Z. The other way, I think, is just in terms of how you talk to Generation Z. It's important, I think, to talk to them in a way that they can imagine themselves making a difference because so much of, I think, politics and how we talk about things is framed in terms of national discussions. You look at um, what cable news channels focus on, and it's all about you know Congress and, and the president and the White House. And I think for a lot of the people who I talk to, they look at that and they find it really scary to imagine how they can make a difference. And so I think to reshift the conversation to the, the best way I think to make a difference is looking in your community, looking in what's happening in your local municipality and, and, and finding ways to get involved in small ways. And I think once young people know that they can get involved and make a difference on a small level, then I think it becomes much more empowering for young people to um, get involved in bigger ways. So let me ask you, um, not that you are the spokesperson person for Generation Z, but you're certainly a better spokesperson than I am for Generation Z. If you had to pick one or two or three of the issues that you think are most important um, to be addressed by your generation. And I know it's unfair to limit somebody to just a couple of issues, given so many of the challenges that we're confronting as a nation right now. But from your perspective, what are a couple of the most important substantive issues that you think your generation is going to have to tackle? Absolutely. So um, I definitely don't pretend to be a spokesperson for my generation, but just looking at the data, I think there are a few issues that stand out in terms of kind of what Generation Z cares most about. The first is, and this is relatively recent, is after the fall of um, Dobbs, or the fall of Roe and the Dobbs decision, um, the number of young people who supported um, the right to access abortion just skyrocketed. You have at least 70% in the latest poll that we saw from um, uh, the Harvard Youth Poll and also um, the group Voters of Tomorrow, which I'm a part of. We conducted a poll that show that more than 70% of young people want to see the right uh, to an abortion. And so I think that's a big issue, just this reproductive health care um, um, access for, for young people. I think that's a big issue. The second issue that I think uh, young people care a lot about, and because it affects no matter kind of which party you come from, whether or not you're in high school or in college or in middle school, is reforming uh, gun uh, legislation. So you look at gun safety right now, and it's, um, you know, President Biden made some tremendous accomplishments during his administration passing this bipartisan act, but it doesn't go nearly far enough. You still have people who can access things like military uh, assault weapons that are totally just devastating so many communities across America. And so I think for younger people, there is this hunger to reform our nation's broken gun laws because we have to go through mass shooter drills um, on a, at least for me, it was twice a semester. And having to go through that, I think for no matter what party you come from, it's a reality that a lot of young people have to live in. So I think that's issue number two. And then the last issue is climate change that I think um, a lot of young people care about. We've seen this climate really um, go through worse than, you know, very bad things as we as we age. And so you look at, you know, summers with, with tropical storms, you look at hurricanes, you look at 
um, you know, warmer temperatures. And so I think, you know, no matter which uh, party you come from, again, you, you are living in this world that is becoming increasingly um, less habitable. And, and, and so I think that's another concerning aspect for my generation. But, you know, one of the things that makes Generation Z unique um, is that there are so many issues coming at us. So those might be the top three that at least the polling indicates, at least I've heard of, but you also have things like the cost of education. Um, right now, college and um, tuition costs are skyrocketing with, um, uh, you know, a little, um, you know, improvement with in terms of how President Biden has um, relieved student loan debts, but you have college getting to an all-time high, you have mental health um, issues across the nation and a lack of mental health services, and so I think you have all these issues facing Generation Z, and so you really can't um, point to one issue that everyone cares about, but um, on the whole, I think it's abortion um, and then uh, gun reform and also climate change. That seems to be the biggest issues. Okay. And you've talked a little bit about how you can inspire and engage your generation. If you were to talk up a couple of generations to the boomers, um, what do you think we can do better um, to engage, to inspire, to encourage the younger generations to really take up the mantle uh, on issues that you were just discussing and others to really try to move us in a better direction as a country. I think one of the best traits for, um, you know, is as you age, I'm sure you know this, um, you have more wisdom, you have more experience, you have more perspective. And that's part of what I found to be so amazing with um, my co-host, Jill Wine Banks, who's many generations older than I am, but there is this intergenerational effort that I think is so important because you can't, uh, you know, I think you need older people to guide or guide younger people. I think you need younger people to show older generations what it's kind of new, what's what's trendy. But I think at the end of the day, in terms of advice for maybe older generations and how they can inspire younger generations, I think it's just not shying away from conversations. And I think at the end of the day, just trying to listen to young people and that some of the issues that we care about. I think at a lot of the times when I talk to um, older people, there's this rush, I think, to um, uh, you know offer solutions. There's this rush to kind of assume what young people care about. But I think listening is the most important thing that um, older generations can do when it comes to young younger generations, and then offering small ways to get involved. I mentioned that I think one of the best ways for younger people to talk to other young people is to start local and to start small. I think that's the same thing with older generations, offering ways that young people can get involved in small incremental steps. And I think that helps young people, again, see that there is a way to make change. And so I think, um, you know, at the same time as listening, also offering that perspective in terms of offering local small ways to get involved in politics and, and about those issues. Um, so I wanna ask you the question that I mentioned, um, somebody asked of me recently in an interview, um, what is it that leaves you optimistic about the, the future of, of America? I think there's a lot of things that I'm pessimistic about. I mean, in terms of right now, as we're talking, we see this House of Representatives voting. Um, Republicans are on their at least um, ninth round voting right now. I mean, there's just so much chaos and division in all across the country. You see this partisanship and, and this unwillingness of both sides to come together, but particularly among one party, the Republican Party, which is so comfortable with spreading lies. And you have George Santos fabricating many parts of his resume, but what gives me optimism is I think this new generation rising up and, and you see starting in 2018, younger people uh, aren't afraid to make their voices heard. They made history by voting in record numbers that continued in 2020. And one of the things that I saw that was different in 2022 was that you saw a historic number of young people actually run for office. And not only did they run for office, they also, they also won their offices. So you see Maxwell Frost as the first member of Generation Z now in Congress. You see people like Nabila Syed in Illinois, who's the first member of Generation Z to serve in the Illinois state legislature. So up and down the ballot, you have younger people taking the helm and running for office and, and winning their uh, positions. I think that offers a very fresh new perspective of, of young people um, really just kind of taking on new leadership positions. I think that gives me optimism. But also, I think this willingness, I think right now of a lot of people, I think, especially after the midterm elections, I think there is a new kind of hunger to just return to normalcy. And you have a lot of people who rejected what Trump stood for, what Trumpism stood for. And I hope that can last into the coming years and, and um, decades. Uh, hopefully there is less of Trump and more of normalcy and, and facts and truth. And so let me finish with this because I am kind of a justice-centric justice guy, as you could probably tell from the big sign behind me. And I always tell everybody my four years of high school woodshop did come in handy when I was 
building that myself, not a joke. Um, but, you know, I was at the Department of Justice for decades. And before that, I was an army JAG trying court martial cases. Um, and, and so I like to ask people, um, what does justice mean to you? There is no one definition. And I think it means different things to different people. But what does it mean to you? I'm not going to ask you to speak for your generation, but if you want to broaden it out, I'd be happy to hear that too. Well, that's a big question. And, and um, you know, I think to me, justice is in, in some ways related to, I think, accountability. I think for so long, there has been an issue of justice. And you see this with Trump and you see this with the Republican Party. I think there is this lack of um, ability for accountability and also justice. But I think that's starting to change with January 6th and some of the investigations going on right now. But I think at the end of the day, it's holding people to account. It's, it's you know, people who commit wrongdoing. I think they have to face some sort of accountability and justice for um, what they do. And and I think for, you know, to broaden it out, um, I think one of the best things that we saw was justice to play out after the Black Lives Matter protests. You know, nothing is going to um, take away the, the suffering, the pain, the agony of, of those who lost their lives due to a uh, police brutality or, or to, um, you know, um, just racial injustice. But what you saw was these court rulings that really, I think, put people where they belonged and I think gave families the justice that they deserved. And I think looking at a historical pattern, one of the things that Generation Z, um, I think, cares most about because we're such a diverse generation is making sure that we do, um, you know, give people the justice that they deserve after such a long time of, I think, a failure to do so. And so I think there is this strong appetite, at least from me and I think from Generation Z to see this happen right now and, and to hold people accountable um, for, for, for what they have done and give people the relief and, and justice that they deserve. Well, great. I appreciate you sharing your perspective. And let me ask you, how can people find you? Yeah, so if Twitter um, survives, I will still be on Twitter at VictorShe2020, and I'm also on Instagram, not quite on TikTok yet. I think that's um, definitely, I don't dance, I don't I do not do any singing, so that that I'm, I'm staying off of, but I'm on Post and Mastodon, so VictorShe on, on all of those platforms. All right, well, thank you for spending some time talking with me. Thank you for engaging in the way ways you have engaged, and in the advice you have for inspiring others to engage because that's you know what it's all about you know uh, one person can only do but so much but multiply it by two four eight and then you know we can all really have an impact so um please keep up the great work and thanks for spending some time today thanks so much glenn and, and thank you for all you do too